good wishes to all of you history of medieval india chapter 11 cultural development in india 1300 to 1500 audiobook the establishment of the delhi sultanate towards the beginning of the year 13th century may be said to mark a new phase in the cultural development of the country the turkish invaders who came to india were by no means rude barbarians coming to west asia during the 9th and 10th centuries from their central asian homelands they had accepted islam just as the earlier invaders from central asia had accepted buddhism and hinduism they had also assimilated rapidly into the culture of the area the arabo persian culture which had embraced the islam islamic lands from morocco and spain to iran and its uh, adjacent area was at its uh, height at the time the people of the region had made uh, many important contributions in the field of science navigation and literature etc when the turks came to india they not only had a well defined faith in islam to which they were deeply attached but they also had definite ideas on government art architecture etc the interaction of the turks with the indians who held strong religious beliefs and had well developed ideas no art architecture and literature architecture and literature resulted in the long run in the development of a new enriched culture but the process was a long one of destruction followed or accompanied by periods of construction mutual misunderstanding and strife is always present when the two sides have strongly held views more significant however were the efforts at mutual understanding which ultimately led to a process of assimilation in many fields such as art and architecture music literature and even in the fields of customs and ceremonies rituals and religious beliefs science and techno science and technology however the elements of confrontation and conflict remain strongly entrenched in both the communities the process of assimilation and convergence therefore had many ups and downs and varied from region to region from field to field and from period to period architecture one of the first requirements of the new rulers was houses to live in and places of worship they had first converted some temples and other existing buildings into mosques while destroying many others and using their materials for building mosques examples of this these are the kawalt ul islam mosque near the qutub minar in delhi and the building at azmir called arahe din ka jonpra the former had a been a temple the later a monastery the only new construction at delhi was a facade of three elaborately carved arches in front of the garbagriha which was demolished the style of decoration used on these arches is very interesting no human or animal figures were used since it was considered un islamic to do so instead they used scrolls of flowers and verses from the quran which were intervened in a very artistic manner soon the turks started constructing their own buildings for this purpose they mostly used indigenous craftsmen such as stone cutters masons etc who were famous for their skills later some master architects came to india from west asia in their buildings the turks used the arch and the dome on a wide scale neither the arch nor the dome was a turkish or muslim invention a arabs borrowed them from rome through the byzantine empire developed them and made them their own the use of the arch and the dome had a number of advantages the dome provided a pleasing skyline and as the architects gained more experience and conf- confidence the dome was higher many experiments were made by placing a round dome on a square building and raising the dome higher and higher in this way many lofty and impressive buildings were constructed the arch and the dome dispensed with the need for a large number of pillars to support the roof and enabled the construction of large halls with a clear view such places of assembly were useful in mosques as well as in palaces however the arch and, and the dome needed strong cement otherwise the stones could not be held in place the turks used fine quality light mortar in their buildings this new architectural forms 
and mortar of a superior kind became widespread in North India with the arrival of the Turks. The ark and the dome had been known to Indian earlier, but they were not used on a large scale. Moreover, the correct scientific method of constructing the ark was rarely employed. The architectural device generally used by the Indians consisted of putting one stone over another, narrowing the gap till it could be covered by a coping stone or by putting a beam over the slab of stones. The Turkish rulers used both the dome and ark method and the slab and beam method in their buildings. In the spirit of decoration, the Turks obscured any representation of human and animal figures in their buildings. Instead, they use a geometrical and floral designs, combining them with panels of inscriptions containing verses from the Quran. Thus, the Ar Arabic script itself became a work of art. The combination of these decorative devices was called arabesque. They also freely borrowed Hindu motifs such as the bell motif, the bell motif, swastik, swastika, lotus, etc. Thus, like the Indians, the Turks were intensely fond of decoration. The skill of the Indian stone cutters were cutters was fully used for the purpose. The walls of the small tomb of Iltutmish near the Qutub Minar Delhi were so intricately intricately carved uh, that a hardly a square inch is uh, left vacant. The Turks also added color to their buildings by using red sandstone. Yellow sandstone or marble was used in these buildings for decoration and to show of the color of red sandstone. The most magnificent building constructed by the Turks in the 13th century was the Qutub Mina. This tapering tower, originally 71.4 meters high, was begun by Ibuk and completed by Iltutmish. It is wrong to think that it was dedicated to the Sufi saint Qutub, Qutub Uddin Bakhtiyar Kaki. Kutubuddin Bakhtiyar Kaki, the venerated saint of Delhi, since it was not called the Kutub Minar at the time, but the Kuwat ul Islam Mosque. Although traditions of tower building are to be found both in India and West Asia, the Kutub Minar is unique in many ways. It derives its effect mainly from the skillful manner in which the balconies have been projected yet linked with the main tower, with the use of red and white sandstone and marble in panels and in the top stages and a ribbon effect. The culture period saw a lot of building activity. Alauddin built his capital at Siri, a few kilometers away from the site around the Qutub. Unfortunately, hardly anything of this city survives now. Alauddin planned a tower twice the height of the Qutub but did not live to complete it. But he added an entrance door to the Qutub. This door, which is called the Alai Darwaza, has arches of very pleasing proportions. It also contains a dome which for the first time was built on correct scientific lines. Thus, the art of building the ark and the dome on scientific lines had been mastered by the Indian craftsmen by this time. There was great building activity in the Tughlaq period which marked the climax of the Delhi Sultanate as well as the beginning of the, its decline. Jayasuddin and Muhammad Tughlaq built the huge palace fortress complex called Tughlaqbad. By blocking the passage of the Yamuna, a huge artificial lake was created around it. The tomb of Jayasuddin marks a new trend in architecture. To have a good skyline, the building was placed atop a high platform. Its beauty was heightened by a marble dome. A striking feature of a Tughlaq architecture was the sloping walls. This is called batter and gives the effect of strength and solidity to the building. However, we do not find any batter in the buildings of Firoz Tughlaq. A second feature of Tughlaq architecture was the deliberate attempt to combine the principles of the arc and the lintel and beam in their buildings. This is found in a marked manner in the buildings of Firoz Tughlaq. The Hoskas was a pleasant resort and had a huge lake around it. It also had a Madaras, Madarsa. The same is to be found in some buildings of Firusha's new fort, which is now called the Kotla. The Tughlaqs did not generally use the costly red sandstone in their buildings, but the 
cheaper and more easily available grey stone. Since it was not easy to carve this type of stone, the Tughlabad Tughlaq buildings have minimal decorations. But the decorative device found in all the buildings of Firuz is a lotus. Many grand mosques were also built in this period. It is not possible to describe all of them here. What is worth nothing is that by this time an independent style of architecture had emerged in India, combining many of the new devices brought by the Turks with the endogenous forms. The Lodis developed this tradition further. Both the Ark and the Linter and Beam are used in their buildings, balconies, kiosks, and eaves in the Rajasthani Gujarati style are also used. Another device used by the Lodis was placing their buildings, especially tombs, on a high platform, thus giving the building a feeling of size as well as a better skyline. Some of the tombs were placed in the midst of gardens. The Lodi Garden in Delhi is a fine example of this. Some of the tombs were of an octagonal shape. Many of these features were adopted by the Mughals later on and their uh, culmination is to be found in the Taj Mahal built by Shah Jahan. By the time the Delhi Sultanate disintegrated, individual styles of architecture had also developed in the various kingdoms in different parts of India. Many of these again were powerfully influenced by the local traditions of architecture. This, as we have seen, happened in Bengal, Gujarat, Malwa, the Deccan, etc. During the 14th and 15th centuries, this style of architecture evolved in Delhi and the Tughlaq was carried forward and modified in the various regional kingdoms. Thus, there was an outburst of a building activity marked by the growth of many styles of architecture in different parts of the country. Religious ideas and beliefs Islam was no stranger to India when the Turks established their empire in North India. Islam had been established in Sindh from the 8th century and the Punjab from the 10th century. Arab travelers had settled in Kerala between the 8th and 10th centuries. During this period, Arab travelers and Sufi saints traveled to different parts of India. al Biruni's book Kitab ul Hind and other writings had familiarized the learned sections in West Asia about Hindu ideas and beliefs. As has been noted earlier, Buddhist lores, Indian fables and books on astronomy and medicine had been translated into Arabic. Visits of Indian yogis to the region were not unknown. The influence of Buddhism and Vedantic ideas on Islamic thinking has been a subject of considerable debate among scholars. Remnants of Buddhist monasteries, stupas and images of the Buddha found in Afghanistan and parts of Central Asia, particularly along old trade routes, show the extent of Buddhist influence in these areas at one time. While it is difficult to determine the precise extent of the influence of Indian philosophic ideas, it is hardly disputable that both Greek and Indian ideas in different proportions may be Definite contribution on the uh, contribution to the development of Islamic philosophy in its formative phase. These ideas provided the background to the rise of the Sufi movement, which after its establishment in India after the 12th century, influenced both Muslims and Hindus, and thus provided a common platform for the two. However, scholars believe that while various rituals and practices, including yogic practices, were freely drawn upon from Hinduism by the early Sufis and assimilated into their system, their basic ideological structure remained Islamic. The Sufi movement The 10th century is important in Islamic history for a variety of reasons. It marks the rise of the Turks on the, Turks on the rise of the Abbasid Caliphate as well as important changes in the realm of ideas and beliefs. In the realm of ideas, it marks the end of the domination of the Mutazila or rationalist philosophy and the rise of orthodox schools based on the Quran and Hadith, traditions of the Prophet and his uh, campaigns, companions and of the Sufi mystic orders. The rationalist had been accused of spreading spectism and atheism. 
in particular it was argued that the philosophy of monism which held that gold and the created world were fundamentally one was hier- hierarchical on the ground that it abolished the difference between the creator and the created the works of the traditionalists crystallized in four schools of islamic law of these the hanfi school which was a most liberal was adopted by the eastern turks who later came to india mystics who are called sufis had risen in islam at a very early stage most of them were persons of deep devotion who were dis- uh, disgusted by the vulgar display of wealth and degeneration of morals following the establishment of the islamic empire hence these saints wanted to have nothing to do with the state a tradition which continued later on some of the early sufis such as the umayyad mystic rabia 8th century and mansur bin halad halad d 10th century laid great emphasis on love as the bond between gold and the individual soul but their pantheistic approach led them into conflict with the orthodox elements who had mansur executed for heresy despite this setback mystic ideas continued to spread among the muslim masses all ghazali the 11th wall who is venerated both by the orthodox elements and the sufis tried to reconcile mysticism with the islamic orthodoxy this he was able to do in a large measure he gave a further blow to rationalist philosophy by arguing that a positive knowledge of god and his equalities cannot be gained by reason but only by revelation thus the revealed book quran was written for a mystic around this time the sufis were organized into 12 orders or silsilas a silsila was generally led by a prominent mystic who lived in a kanko or hospice along with his disciples disciples the link between the teacher or peer and his disciples or murids was a vital part of the sufi system every peer nominated a successor or wali to carry on his work the monastic organization of the sufis and some of their pa- practices such as penance fasting and holding the breath are sometimes traced to buddhist and hindu yogic influence buddhism was widely prevalent in central asia before the advent of islam and the legend of the buddha as a saintly man had passed into islamic legend yogis continued to visit west asia even after the advent of islam and the yogic book amrit kun had been translated into persian from sanskrit thus hindu and buddhist practices and ritual seems to ha- uh, seem to have have been observed in assimilated by the sufis even before they came to india with their buddhist philosophic ideas and vedantist ideas had in a significant manner influenced sufism is a matter of controversy the origin of ideas is difficult to trace the sufi saints and many modern thinkers trace sufi ideas to the quran what is important to note here is that irrespective of origin there were many similarities in the ideas of the sufis and the hindu yogis and mystic about the nature of god and his relationship with the soul and the material world this provided a basic basis for mutual toleration and understanding the human spirit of sufism is well expressed by sanai a leading persian poet of the time faith and infidelity both are galloping on the way towards him and are exclaiming together he is one and none share his kingdom the sufi uh, the sufi orders are broadly divided into two basara that is those which followed the islamic law shara and bishara that is those which were not bound by it both types of orders prevailed in india the later being followed more by va- wandering saints although these saints did not establish an order some of them became figures of popular veneration often for muslims and hindus alike the chishti and uh, suharwardi silsilas 
of the Bar Shara movements, only two acquired significant influence and following in North India during the 13th and 14th centuries. These were the Chishti and Suharwardhi Silsilas. The Chishti order was established in India by Kwacha Moinuddin Chishti, who came to India around 1192, shortly after the defeat and death of Fritvira Chauhan. After staying for some time in Lahore and Delhi, he finally shifted to Azmir, which was an important political center and already had a sizable Muslim popul population. No authentic record of his activities is available. He did not write any book, but his fame rose, it seems, along with that of the, his successors. Among the displays of uh, Sheikh Muinuddin, D1235 were Bakhtiar Kaki and his dis dispel Farid Uddin Ganja Shakar. Farid Uddin confined his activities to Hansi and Azodhan in modern Haryana and the Punjab, respectively. He was deeply respected in Delhi, so much so that streams of people would throng around him whenever he visited Delhi. His outlook was so broad and humane that some of his verses are later found quoted in the Adigra Adigranth of the Sikhs. Adigranth of the Sikhs. The most famous of the uh, Chisti saints, however, were Nizamuddin, Oliya, and Nasiruddin, Chiragi, Idalhi. These early Sufis uh, mingled freely with people of the lower classes, including the Hindus. They led a simple Ashtari life and conversed with people in Hindavi, Hindavi, their local dialectic dialect. They were hardly interested in affecting conver conversions, though later on many families and groups attributed their conversation to the good wishes of these saints. These Sufi saints made themselves popular by adopting musical recitations called Sama to create a mood of nearness to God. Moreover, they often chose Hindi verses for the purpose since they could have a greater impact on their listeners. Nizamuddin Aliyam adopted yogic breathing exercises so much so that the yogis called, the, called him a Siddh or perfect. After the death of Nasiruddin Ch Chirag I Delhi in the middle of the 14th century, the Chistis did not have a commanding figure at Delhi. As a result, the Chistis saints disappeared and extended their message to the eastern and southern parts of India. The Shuharwardi order entered India at about the same time as the Chistis, but its activities were confined largely to the Punjab and Multan. The most well-known saints of the order were Sheikh Shihabuddin, Shuharwardi and Hamid Uddin Nagori. Unlike the Chistis, the Shuharwardi saints did not believe in leading a life of poverty. They accepted the service of the state, and some of them held important posts in the ecclesiastical department. The Chistis, on the other hand, preferred to keep a loop from state politics and shunned the company of rulers and nobles. Nevertheless, both helped the rulers in their own way by creating a climate of opinion in which people belonging to different sects and religions could live in peace and harmony. While Mecca remained the holy of Holies, the rise of popular saints provided a useful point of veneration and devotion to the mass of Muslims within the country. The Bhakti Movement The Bhakti Movement, which stressed the mystical union of the individual with God, had been at work in India long before the arrival of the Turks. Although the seeds of bhakti can be found in the Vedas, it was not emphasized during the early period. The idea of the adoration of a personal god seems to have developed with the growing popularity of Buddhism. During the early centuries of the Christian era, under Mahayana Buddhism, the Buddha began to be worshipped in his gracious Avalokita form. The worship of Vishnu developed more or less at the same time. When many of the holy books such as the Ramayana and the Mahabharata were rewritten during Gupta times, Bhakti was accepted along with 
jnana and karma as one of the recognized roads to salvation however the development of popular bhakti took place in south india between the 7th and the 12th century as has been noticed earlier the shaiva nainars and the vaishnavit alvars disregarded the asterites preached by the jainas and the buddhists and preached personal devotion to god as a means of salvation they disregarded the residuities of the caste system and carried their message of love and personal devotion to god to various parts of south india by using the local languages although there were many points of contact between south and north india the transmission of the ideas of bhakti saints from south to north india was a slow and long run out process oddly enough the very reasons which made the nainars and alvars popular in the south limited their appeal outside the area with the fact that they preached and composed in the local languages sanskrit was still the vehicle of thought in the country the ideas of bhakti were carried to the north by scholars as well as by saints among these mentioned me may be made of the maharashtrian saint namadeva who flourished in the first part of the 14th century and ramananda who is placed in the second half of the 14th and the first quarter of the 15th century namadeva was a tailor who it is said had taken to banditry before becoming a saint his poetry which was written in marathi breathes a spirit of intense love and devotion to god namadeva is said to have traveled far and wide and engaged in discussions with the, the sufi saints at delhi ramananda who was a follower of ramanuja was born at prayag alhabad and lived there and at benares he substituted the worship of rama rama in place of vishnu what is more he taught his doctrine of bhakti to all the four varnas and disregarded the ban on people of different castes cooking together and sharing their meals he enrolled disciples from all castes including the low castes thus among his disciples was ravidas who was a cobbler by caste kabir who was a weaver sena who was a barber and sadhana who was a butcher namadeva was equally broad minded in enrolling his disciples the seeds scattered by these saints fell on the tiles all the brahmanas had lost both in prestige and power following the defeat of the rajput rulers and the establishment of the turkish sultanate sultanate as a result movements such as the nath panthi movement challenging the caste system and the superiority of the brahmanas had gained popularity these coins with the islamic ideas of equality and brotherhood which had been preached by the sufi saints people were no longer satisfied with their religion which only emphasized ceremonies and forms they wanted a religion which could satisfy both their reason and emotions it was due to these factors that the bhakti movement became popular in north india during the 15th and 16th centuries among those who were most critical of the existing social order and made a strong plea for hindu muslim unity the names of kabir and nanak stand out there is a good deal of uncertainty about the dates and early life of kabir legend has it that he was the son of a brahman widow who abandoned him after his birth and that he was brought up in the house of a muslim weaver he learned the profession of his adoptive father but while living in kashi he came in contact with both the hindu and muslim saints kabir who is generally placed in the 15th century emphasized the unity of god whom he calls by several names such as rama hari govinda allah sain sahib etc he strongly denounced idol worship pilgrimages bathing in holy rivers or taking part in formal worship including namaz nor did he consider it necessary to abandon the life of a householder for the sake of a saintly life to familiar with yogi practices he considered neither ascetism nor book knowledge important for true knowledge as a modern historian dr thara chan says the mission of kabir was to preach a religion of love which would unite unite all castes and creeds 
he rejected those features of hinduism and islam which were against this spirit and which were of no importance for the real spiritual welfare of the individual kabir strongly denounced the caste system especially the practice of untouchability and emphasized the fundamental unity of man he was opposed to all kinds of discrimination between human beings whether on the basis of caste or religion race family or wealth his sim- sympathies were decidedly with the poor with whom he identified himself however he was not a social reformer he emphasized being reform of the individual under the guidance of a true guru or teacher guru nanak from whose teachings the sikh religion was derived was born in a khatri family in the village of talwandi now called nankana on the banks of the river ravi in 1469 although married early and trained in persian to take his father's profession of accountancy nanak showed a mystic contemplative bent of mind and preferred the company of saints and sadhus some time later he had a mystic vision and force of the world he composed hymns and sang them to the accompaniment of the rabab a stringed instrument played by his faithful attendant mardana it is said that nanak undertook wide tours all over india and even beyond to it to sri lanka in the south and mekana medina in the west he attracted a large number of people towards him and his name and fame had spread far and wide before his death in 1538 like kabir nanak laid emphasis on the one god by repeating whose names and dwellings on it with love and devotion one could get a salvation without a distinction of caste creed or sect however nanak laid great emphasis on the purity of character and conduct as the first condition of approaching god and the need of a guru for guidance like kabir he strongly denounced idol worship pilgrimages and other formal observances of the various faiths he advocated a middle path in which spiritual life could be combined with the duties of the householder nanak had no intention of founding a new religion his catholic approach aimed at a bridging distinctions between the hindus and the muslims in order to create an atmosphere of peace goodwill and mutual give and take this was also the aim of kabir different uh, opinions have been expressed by scholars about the impact of their ideas on the large mass of hindus and muslims it has been argued that the old forms of religion continued almost unchanged nor was it possible to effect any major breach in the caste system in course of time the ideas of nanak gave birth to a new creed sikhism while the followers of kabir shrank into a sect the kabir panthis the importance of the mission of kabir and nanak should however be assessed from a broader point of view they created a climate of opinion which continued to work through the succeeding centuries it is well known that the religious ideas and policies of akbar reflected in a remarkable manner the fundamental teachings of these two great saints nor was akbar alone in pursuing such policies as we have seen in an earlier chapter however it was hardly to be expected that the orthodox elements in the two main religions hinduism and islam would surrender without a fight as we shall see the orthodox elements mustered behind the defense of the old faith which was re- redefined to meet the new challenge the struggle between these two broad trends once liberal and non sectarian the other orthodox and traditional was at the heart of the intellectual and religious controversies during the 16th 17th and 18th centuries it is this continuing struggle which shows that the impact of the ideas and concepts put forward by kabir nanak and others of the same way of thinking was by no means insignificant the vaishnavite movement apart from the non sectarian movement led by kabir and nanak the bhakti movement in north india developed around the worship of rama and krishna rama and krishna two of the incarnations of the god vishnu the childhood escapades of the boy krishna and his dalliance with her milk maids of gokul especially with radha became the themes of a remarkable series of saint poets who lived and preached during the 15th and early 16th centuries 
and they use the love between Radha and Krishna in an allegorical manner to depict the relationship of love in its various aspects between the individual soul and the supreme soul like the early sufis chaitanya popularized music gatherings or kirtana as a special form of mystic experience in which the outside world disappeared upon dwelling on god's name according to chaitanya worship consisted of love and devotion and song and dance which produced a state of ecstasy in which the presence of gold a uh, presence of god whom he called hari could be realized such worship could be carried out by all irrespective of caste or creed the writings of narsin narsinha mehta in gujarat of meera in rajasthan of surdas in western uttar pradesh and chaitanya in bengal and odisha reached extraordinary heights of lyrical fervor and of love which transcended all boundaries including those of caste and creed these saints were prepared to welcome into their fold everyone irrespective of caste or creed this is seen most clearly in the life of chaitanya born and schooled in nadia which was the center of vedantic rationalism chaitanya's tenor of life was changed when he visited gaya at the age of 22 and was initiated into the krishna cult by a recluse he became a god intoxicated devotee who instantly uh, instantly uttered the name of krishna chaitanya is uh, said to have traveled all over india including vrindavan uh, where he revived the krishna cult but most of his time was spent at gaya he exerted an extraordinary influence particularly in the eastern parts of india and attracted a wide following including some muslims and people from the locals he did not reject the scriptures or idol worship so he cannot be classified as a traditionalist all the saint poets mentioned above remain with the broad framework of hinduism their philosophic beliefs were a brand of vedantic monism which emphasized the fundamental unity of god and the created world the vedantist philosophy had been propounded by a number of thinkers but the one who probably influenced the saint poets the most was vallabha a thailanga brahman who lived in the last part of the 15th and the early part of the 16th century the approach of these saint poets was broadly humanistic the emphasis at the broadest human sentiments the sentiments of love and beauty in all their forms like the other non sectarians they were not able to make an effective breach in the caste system however they softened its rigor and built a platform for unity which could be apprehended by wider sections the basic concept of the saint poets were reciprocated to a remarkable degree by the sufi poets and saints of the period during the 15th century the monastic ideas of the great arab philosopher Ibn Arabi become became popular among broad sections in India. Arabi had been vehemently denounced by the orthodox element and his followers persecuted because he held that all beings are essentially one and everything is a manifestation of the divine substance. Thus in his opinion the different religions were identical. Arabi's doctrine of unity of being is known as tauhid i wasuthi unity of being this doctrine kept gaining popularity in india and became the main basis of sufi to before the time of akbar contact with the yogis and hindu saints went a long way in popularizing the concept of um, pantheism the indian sufis started taking a greater interest in sanskrit and hindi and a few of them including malik muhammad jaisi composed their works in delhi in hindi the bhakti songs of the vaishnavic saints written in hindi and other languages touched the hearts of the sufis more than persian poetry did the use of hindi songs became so popular that an eminent sufi abdul wahid bilgrami wrote a treatise hakai i hindi 
in which he tried to explain such words as Krishna, Murli, Gopis, Radha, Yamuna, etc. In Sufi monastic terms, thus during the 15th and the early part of the 16th century, the Bhakti and the Sufi saints had worked out in a remarkable manner a common platform on which people belonging to various sects and creeds could meet and understand each other. This was the essential background to the ideas of Akbar and his concept of whom Taihid or unity of all religions, literature and fine arts, Sanskrit literature. Sanskrit continued to be a vehicle for higher thought and a medium for literature during the period under review. In fact, the production of works in Sanskrit in different branches was immense and perhaps greater than in the preceding period. Following the great Sankara, words in the field of philosophy by Ramanuja, Madhava, Vallabha, etc. continued to be written in Sanskrit. The speed with which their ideas were widely disseminated and discussed in different parts of the country showed the important role which Sanskrit continued to play during the period. There was a network of specialized schools and academies in different parts of the country, including areas under Muslim domination. These schools and academies were not interfered with the continued to flourish in fact, many of them took advantage of the introduction of paper to reproduce and disseminate older texts. Thus, some of the oldest available texts of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata written on paper belong to the period between the 11th and 12th century. Besides philosophy, works in the field of Kavya, poetical, narrative, drama, fiction, medicine, astronomy, music, etc. continued to be written in Sanskrit. A large number of commentaries and digests on Hindu law, Dharma Shastras were prepared between the 12th and the 16th century. The great Mithakshara of Vijnaneshwar, which forms one of the top principal Hindu schools of law, cannot be placed earlier than the 12th century. Another famous commentator, commentator was Chandeshwar of Bihar, who lived in the 14th century. Most of the other works were produced in the south, followed by Bengal, Mithila, and Western India under the patronage of Hindu rulers. The Jains, too, contributed to the growth of Sanskrit. Hemachandra Suri was the most eminent among them. Oddly enough, these works largely ignored the presence of the Muslims in the country. Little attempt was made to translate Islamic works or Persian literature into Sanskrit. Possibly the only exception was the translation of the love story of Yusuf and Julaika written by the famous Persian poet Jami and translation of works or the, on the astrolabe used in navigation and astrology. Arabic and Persian literature Although the greatest amount of literature and scientific works produced by the Muslims was in Arabic, which was the language of the Prophet and was used as the language of literature and science from Spain to Baghdad. The Turks who came to India were deeply influenced by the Persian language, which had become the literary and administrative language of Central Asia from the 10th century onwards. In India, the use of Arabic remained largely confined to a narrow circle of narrow circle of Islamic scholars and philosophers. Most of the original literature on the subject being written in Arabic, a few works on science and astronomy were also translated from Arabic. In course of time, digests of Islam law were prepared in Persian with the help of Indian scholars. The most well known of these were prepared in the region of Firuz Tughlaq, but Arabic digests continued to be prepared. The most famous of them being the Fathava i Almgiri or the Digest of Laws prepared by a group of jurists in the region of Aurangzeb. With the arrival of the Turks in India during the 10th century, a new language Persian was introduced in the country. There was a resurgence of the Persian language in Iran and Central Asia from the 10th century onwards and some of the greatest poets of the Persian language such as Firdausi and Sadi, lived and composed their works between the 10th and 14th centuries. 
from the beginning the turks adopted persian as the language of literature and administration in the country thus lahore emerged as the first center for the cultivation of the persian language although the works of only a few of these early writers of persian in india have survived we find in the writings of some of them such as masud sad salman a sense of attachment and love for lahore however the most notable persian writer of the period was amir khusru born in 12 1252 at uh, patiali near bhadayun in western uttar pradesh amir khusru took pride in being an indian he says i have praised india for two reasons first because india is the land of my birth and of our country love of the country is an important obligation hindustan is like heaven its climate is better than that of khurasan it is green and full of flowers and the year round the brahmanas here are as learned as aristotle and there are many scholars in various fields khusru's love for india shows that the turkish ruling class was no longer willing be willing to behave a foreign ruling class and that the ground had been prepared for a cultural approachment between them and the indians khusru wrote a large number of poetical works including historical romances he experienced with all the poetical forms and created a new style of persian which came to be called the sabak i hindi or the style of india khusru praised the indian languages including hindi which he calls hindvi some of his scattered hindi verses can be found to the hindi work kali bari often attributed to khusru was in all probability the work of a later poet of the same name he was also an a compilation musician and took part in religious musical gatherings sama organized by the famous sufi saint nizamuddin aliya khusru it is said gave up his life the day after he learned of the death of his peer nizamuddin aliya 1325 he was buried in the same compound apart from poetry a strong school of history writing and persian developed in india during the period the most famous historians of this period were jiauddin barni afif and isami through the persian language india was able to develop close cultural relations with the central asia and iran in course of time persian became not only the language of administration and diplomacy but also the language of the upper classes and their dependents as first in north india and later of the entire country with the expansion of the delhi sultanate to the south and the establishment of muslim kingdoms in different parts of the country thus sanskrit and persian in the main function as link languages in the country in politics religion and philosophy as well as being the means of literary production at first there was a little inter- interchange between the two jia nakshabdhi nakshabi Uh, the 1350 was the first to translate into persian sanskrit stories which were related by a parrot to a woman whose husband had gone on a journey this book tuti nama book of the parrot uh, written in the time of uh, muhammad tughlaq proved very popular and was translated from persian into turkish and into many european languages as well he also translated the old indian treatise on sexuality the kok shastra into persian later in the time of firoz shah sanskrit books on medicine and music were translated into persian sultan zain ul abidin of kashmir had the famous historical work raj tarangani and the mahabharata translated into persian at his instance sanskrit work on medicine and music were also translated into persian recent research shows that show works on mathematics astronomy and medicine were translated into sanskrit during the period regional languages during this period literary works of high quality were produced in many of the regional languages as well many of these languages such as hindi bengali and marathi uh, trace their origins back to the 8th century or so some others such as tamil were much older written at the beginning of the 14th century amir khusru had noted the 
existence of regional languages and remarked these languages have from ancient times applied in every way to the common purposes of life the rise to maturity of many of these languages and their use as means for literary works may be considered a striking feature of the medieval period there were many reasons for this perhaps this was with the loss of prestige of the brahmanas sanskrit also lost some of its pre- prestige the use of the common language by the bhakti saints was undoubtedly an important factor in the rise of these languages in fact in many parts of the country the early saints fashioned these languages for literary purposes it seems that in many regional kingdoms of the pre turkish period regional languages such as tamil kannada marathi etc were used for administrative purposes in addition to sanskrit this must have continued under turkish rule for we hear of hindi knowing revenue accountants appointed in the delhi sultanate later when the delhi sultanate broke up local languages in addition to persian continued to be used for administrative purposes in many of the regional kingdoms the literature in telugu developed in south india under the patronage of the vijayanagara rulers marathi was one of the administrative languages in the bahmani kingdom and later at the court of bijapur in course of time when these languages had reached a certain stage of development some of the muslim kings gave them patronage for literary purposes also for example nasrat shah of bengal had the mahabharata and the ramayana translated into bengali maladhar basu also translated the bhagavata into bengali his uh, uh, and uh, bengali under his patronage his patronage of bengali poets has been mentioned earlier the use of bhakti poems in hindi by the sufi saints in their musical gatherings has been mentioned before in janpur the sufi saints uh, such as malik mohammed jaisi wrote in hindi and put forward sufi concepts in a form which could be easily understood by the common man they popularized many persian poems such as the mansavi masnavi fine arts trends towards mutual understanding and integration are to be found not only in the fields of religious beliefs and rituals architecture and literature but also in the fields of fine arts particularly music when the turks came to india they inherited the rich arab tradition of music which had been further developed in iran and central asia they brought with them a number of new musical instruments such as the rabab and sarangi and new musical modes and regulations indian music and indian musicians at the court of the caliphs at baghdad had possibly influenced the development of music there however systematic contact between the two began in india under the sultanate we have already referred to amir khusru khusru who, who was given the title of nayak or master of both the theory and practice of music introduced many persian arabic airs ragas such as ayman ghora sanam etc he is credited with having invented the sitar though we have no evidence of this the tabla which is also attributed to him seems however to have developed developed during the late 17th or early 18th century the process of integration in the field of music continued under firuz who used to listen to music every friday after namaz the indian classical work ragadarpan was uh, translated into persian during this region musical gatherings spread from the abodes of the sufis to the palaces of the nobles sultan husain sarki the ruler of janpur was a great patron of music the sufi saint pir bodhan is supposed to have been the second great musician of the age another regional kingdom where music was highly cultivated was the kingdom of gwalior raja man singh of gwalior was a great music lover the workman kautwal in which all the new musical modes introduced by the muslims were included was prepared under his aegis we do not know at what time the musical modes in north india began to differ from those in the south but there is little doubt that the differentiation was largely due to the incorporation of persian arabic modes airs and scales 
A distinctive style of music influenced in considerable mu- measure by Persian music developed in the Kingdom of Kashmir. After the conquest of Jan- uh, Janpur, Sikandar Lodi followed its tradition of patronizing music on a lavish scale, a tradition which was adopted by the Mughal rulers later on. Thank you.